Our pastor Mason is uh, off again this week. Actually, he's not off. He's uh, busy at work. He's working on his doctoral dissertation. So if you have a little bit of time this week, uh, drop him a little text or an email or a little note. Let him know that we're praying for him and uh, that he gets all the writing done because I can't imagine writing that voluminous thing that he has to write. We're going to continue today in the book of Mark. And this passage of Scripture, these these 12 verses that we're going to see, uh, unpacks some very deep theological things, but very practical things. The title of today's sermon is this, Difficult Circumstances of Life with a Heavenly Outcome. Difficult Circumstances of Life with a Heavenly Outcome. We're going to glean three things today from our time together from Scripture. Number one, point one is this, Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Second point is this, Jesus knows our hearts. Jesus knows our hearts. And the third and last point that we're going to see today is Jesus has compassion. Jesus has compassion. Let me just read the first 12 verses of Mark chapter 2. And when he returned to Capernaum some uh, some days, it was reported that he was at home, speaking of Jesus. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And as he was preaching the word to them, there came friends, people bringing a paralytic to him, carried by men. And when they could not get in near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof on top of the place where Jesus was. And when, let me back up in verse four, and when they could not get near him uh, because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they made an opening in the roof, they let down the paralytic man down and lay him down. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were questioning within themselves, he said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father in heaven, as we dive into your scriptures today, I pray that you challenge our hearts and our minds. Allow us to see Jesus in a way that we've never seen him before. Allow us to pick something out of scripture to apply to our lives and make our lives different than when when it was when we walked into this place. God, you're a God of miracles, physical, emotional, and spiritual miracles. Today, as we dive into your scriptures, speak to us to the still, small voice of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The first point that we're gonna kind of dive into today is Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Let me read verses uh, one through five again. And when he returned to Capernaum some days, uh, after some days, it was reported that he was at home and many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door, And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they let down the, they they made an opening in the roof, and they let the bed down 
on which the paralytic was laying. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, Capernaum was in northern Israel on the Sea of Galilee. It was a very prosperous fishing village at that time. It was, uh, actually, I've been to that area. It's a very beautiful part of Israel. It's uh, beautiful. The, the lake is absolutely stunning. And I was actually standing in the ruins of the synagogue where Jesus taught uh, in that town. It was Capernaum that Jesus kind of made his, his ministry basis after he was, in a way, uh, not received well in his hometown of, of Nazareth. Just to kind of put this in a proper perspective, in northern Israel, you've got the Sea of Galilee, and Capernaum is just on the edge north of that. To the bottom right, you have Jordan, then you have the Golan Heights, then you have Syria, and then you have Lebanon up top. So quite frankly, that's in the area of the world right now that, uh, that um, there's uh, some conflict, as we know. So Jesus set up his ministry base in a fishing town called Capernaum. And he set up his home there. Many scholars believe that Jesus was staying in the Apostle Peter's home. He was there for some time uh, during his ministry years, but he kind of made that his home base for ministry and his home base for himself. So he was in, this, in his home, and there's this crowd of people that amassed, so much so that people couldn't get to Jesus. So he's there, and what was he doing? He was teaching them the word. And so these four guys heard about Jesus in this home. They heard about the man that can heal their dear friend, the paralytic. So these four men, we could preach a whole sermon on how to be a friend. Uh, one pastor did a sermon called Four Faithful Friends. So there's a lot of things to glean about friendship in this chapter. We're gonna spend a little bit of time on it, but not much. So these four guys get together their friend and they say, we've gotta get our buddy, we gotta take him to Jesus. At all costs, we gotta get into Jesus. We gotta see him because we want our friend to be healed and we know this man Jesus can heal. So the average male, adult male, weighs around 175, 180 pounds. Scripture doesn't say what this man weighed. I, I don't know. We don't know. But we know that he couldn't walk. He had some sort of physical abnormality, whether it was a deformity, whether it was an accident. We don't know. But we know that he couldn't walk and he was on his mat or on his, his mat. And quite frankly, the mat was called the poor man's bed. Uh, back in that day. So this poor paralytic man was laying on his bed. He couldn't walk. He had four friends, and they're trying to do whatever they can to get to Jesus. I can't imagine being one of those guys and picking up my friend on his little mat or in his bed and trying to maneuver a way to get to Jesus. What faith those four guys had. What faith. So they get to the place where Jesus was, probably Peter's house. They're trying to get into Jesus, but they can't get in. There's so many people around this house, it was so packed that they couldn't get in. So they, had a cross, they were at a crossroads. What do we do? How do we get our friend to Jesus? At that time, the houses were made in such a way that they utilized um, uh, the daytime and the nighttime on the rooftop. So in that area at that time, they would build, build a flat roof that had clay, it had uh, wood, it had uh, tiles made out of clay, uh, and then they pitched it uh, with tar so it wouldn't uh, leak if it rained. And usually on the houses at that time, they had a stairwell going up to the roof from the outside. So a lot of people at that time would go up on the roof in the heat of the day to feel a breeze coming off of the Sea of Galilee. Or at nighttime, they would go up on top of the roof to keep cool. So they, scholars believe that they had a stairwell going up to the roof, and these four faithful men got their friend on a mat and tried to maneuver to get him on top of the roof. Now, I can't imagine what energy or, or strength it took to get this guy up on top of a roof but they did it. They were faithful, and they were friends. They got him on top of this roof, and they were at a crossroads. Okay, we're up here. What do we do now? It doesn't say in Scripture, but I can just imagine in my mind's eye, one of these faithful friends said, well, let's just dig a hole in the roof. 
we could separate some of this, these clay tiles and some of this wood and, 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 and let's, let's, let's dig a hole in the roof because we want to get our friend in the presence of Jesus. So these friends went to great lengths for their friend to be in the presence of Jesus. So they dug a hole in the roof. And because it was a, a, a fishing town, a fishing village, I don't know this to be certain, but I would imagine that they let him down with ropes that they would use as they were casting out nets uh, to catch fish. So the big ro- ropes that they would use, they lowered their friends down. Now, if you were in the crowd and you heard something up on top of the roof, some men digging on top of the roof or, or footsteps on top of the roof, what would you be doing? Jesus was teaching the word. The scribes, the Pharisees were there. A lot of people were in the house. The four faithful men duck, duck, are on top of a roof, and you, you can see this opening, and you can see the sunlight peer in, or if it was an evening time, the light of the moon peer in. And then all of a sudden, they drop this guy down, hand by hand by hand, rope by rope by rope, and they lower him in the presence of Jesus. What a scene. What a dramatic scene of scripture that we see here. So Jesus, knowing that this is going on, he could have stopped it, but he, but he didn't. He could have said, no, guys, we'll, we'll get to you in a little bit. I'm busy, I'm busy teaching God's word. But... He used this man's difficult circumstances for a heavenly outcome. So as this man was being lowered down, I'm imagining that the crowd around Jesus kind of separated. This man comes in direct eye contact with Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, there's a double-edged meaning here. At that time, um, there was a common belief that if you had some sort of physical abnormality or a sickness of some sort, it must be a direct result of sin. So this man was a paralytic. So they may have thought, man, this guy's a big sinner. Look, he can't even walk. That, that is an option that we must wrestle with. The other option is he was just a poor guy with bad luck that was a paralytic. We don't know. He didn't come to get his sins forgiven. He came to to get his legs working, his arms working so he can walk. So they lower him down. He's in front of Jesus and he says, Jesus says, your sins are forgiven. Son, your sins are forgiven. Jesus, in verse five, he saw the faith of the friends. The aggressive, persistent effort of the paralytic friends was visible evidence of their faith in Christ to heal. Jesus viewed this determination in their friends as effort of their faith in him. He did not rebuke them, but he did say, son, your sins are forgiven. Scripture describes complete forgiveness of sin. God, through the power of Jesus Christ, forgives our sin. Scripture has some interesting things to say about the forgiveness of sin. God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. God removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. God casts our sins away from him. God remembers our sins no more. God casts our sins in the depths of the sea. God paid our sin debt in full by the blood of Jesus on the cross. You see, our past sins, our present sins, and our future sins are forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. You know, sin is an ancient Greek term, and the term that that is used uh, in Greek for the word sin is the word hamartia. And the study of sin is hamartiology. So hamartia is an old archer's term where an archer would pull back his bow and arrow and he would try to focus on the target, and specifically the uh, the bull's eye of the target. And if the if the archer would let go and the arrow would go astray, the archer would say, sin. Sin means missing the mark of perfection. And that is all of us. Scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
So Jesus came to take our sins away, just as he did with this poor paralytic man. The man was lowered down in front of Jesus. The crowd separates. The friends are up on the roof looking down. And Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. Let's look at verses 6 through 10. Now sometime, now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they were questioning within themselves, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins. You see, Jesus, the second point is this, Jesus knows our hearts. The scribes were reasoning in their hearts. Jesus knew exactly what they were thinking exactly at that moment and called them on it. You see, the scribes were were primarily Pharisees. They were authorities in Jewish law, sometimes described in Scripture as lawyers. They were professional scholars whose specialty it was to teach and explain the application of the law. So here they are. They hear Jesus say, your sins are forgiven to this man. And the scribes are saying, who can forgive sin but only God himself? And they were saying in their minds and in their hearts, this man is blaspheming because he said that he could forgive sins. And Jesus calls them to the mat. The scribes were incorrect in saying that only God can forgive sins. Were correct, but the scribes were correct in saying that only God can forgive sins, but incorrect in saying Jesus blasphemes. They refused to recognize Jesus' power as coming from God, much less than he himself was God. So Jesus was using this earthly situation of this paralytic man to not only use the situation, and we're going to see as the scripture unfolds, to heal this man physically, but also use it as a teaching tool to say that he was basically saying that he is God by forgiving sins. So he reasoned and he saw what they were thinking in their hearts and he called them to the map. You know, guys, Jesus knows our hearts. I can only be sure of one heart on the planet, and that's my own. But Jesus knows my heart and your hearts much more than we know our hearts ourselves. Several years ago, um, my oldest son is 26 years old. When he was about five, maybe six, it was a Sunday evening, late in the evening, and Sunday night football was coming on. Uh, And I was downstairs in our home getting ready to watch Sunday night football. And my wife had my son upstairs, and they were going over what my youngest, my oldest son, Mike, learned in his class at church that morning. And they were, and, and my youngest son, my oldest son, Mike, who was my only son at that time 20 years ago, made a statement. He said, I learned about King David and how King David was called by God to be the king. Now, I want to read this passage to you. This is 1 Samuel Samuel chapter 16. It's the anointing of King David. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn, horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to make a sacrifice to the Lord and invite Jesse uh, to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me for, uh, him who I declare to you to be king. Samuel did what the Lord had commanded. He came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came out to meet him, trembling and saying, do you come in peace? He said, peacefully I have come to make sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to me with a sacrifice. 
verse six of 1 Samuel 16. So imagine the prophet comes in, Samuel, he goes into this town of Bethlehem. He says, I wanna make a sacrifice, but the idea of making sacrifice, also he wanted to get the next king of Israel. Verse six, all these, all of David's sons come creating by. When, when they came, Samuel looked at Eliab, which was one of the older sons of David. Surely the Lord has appointed him before me. This guy was big, he was old, he was, had stature, he was, he was a man's man. Verse seven is interesting, and I want you to hear these words specifically, and I'm gonna repeat them twice. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his outward outward appearance or his height or his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. To make this story even more interesting is God looks at the heart where we see with our eyes. God sees with the divine where we see as a human sees with human eyes. So all of Jesse's sons parade before Samuel, except for one, the youngest son, David. He was out tending the sheep. Scripture calls him young, ruddy, handsome, I don't know this to be true, but uh, I, I would guess he would be a young teenager at that time. He was the least of the sons. As a matter of fact, he wasn't even thought of. His fathers just had him out tending the sheep. His dad didn't think he was king material. God looks at the heart. He doesn't see what we see. He looks at the heart. That was the story that my oldest son learned in in his Sunday school class. And he told my wife that evening 20 years ago, 21 years ago, what does God see when he looks in my heart? And my wife shared the gospel with my son at that time. And my my son Mike asked Jesus to be a savior and asked him to come into his heart. See, my, my, my little guy, who was about five or six years old, realized that if God looked into his heart, what would he see? If God looks in our hearts, what will he see? If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, come see us. Talk to us after the sermon. Let today be the day that you ask Christ to come into your heart. All you have to do is Ask. Scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe in your heart. So this paralytic man, as he was dropped down, he believed that Jesus could heal him physically. But we're gonna see he got a double blessing. Jesus knows our hearts, but also point three is this. Jesus has compassion. We serve a compassionate savior. He's compassionate. He saw this guy coming down, little by little, rope by rope, coming down. And Jesus was fully human and fully God, so he knew what was going to transpire, but he saw this poor paralytic man coming down. And this guy, in a way, got a double blessing. His sins were forgiven, and we're gonna see what happened next. Verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose immediately. Immediately. I don't know how long this man had been a paralytic. I have no idea. But immediately the man got up off of his bed. He, and I would imagine that, that he hadn't been off, up off that bed for probably his lifetime or a long time. Immediately he picked up his bed and went out before them all. So they were all amazed and glorified, saying, we never saw anything like this. It doesn't say how many people were in this crowd. It doesn't say if there are 10 people, 50 people, 100 people. All I know, it was a crowd, and it was a crowded crowd. So much so that these guys had to dig a hole in the roof to get their buddy to Jesus. 
So this guy laying on the mat has a confrontation with Jesus. Jesus looks at him and quite frankly, he's having kind of uh, two different conversations in a way. He's addressing the paralytic, but he's also addressing the scribes. He says, take up your mat and go home. Jesus leveraged his compassion so that they may know that he had the authority to forgive sins. Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus sees our heart and Jesus has compassion. Where do you need the compassion of Jesus in your life today? You know, sometimes life can be difficult. Struggles, jobs, family, issues, health. Sometimes life can be difficult. If you need the compassionate hand of Jesus Christ today, look to our Savior. Now, I'm not saying that Jesus is going to tell you if you're paralyzed to get up and walk. He could, but I'm not saying that. But I know sometimes life is difficult. Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes we get in a position where all we can do is look up. Let us seek the compassionate hand of our Savior. Worship team, you can come up. I'm about finished. Jesus, as the risen Son of Man, has authority, which means the right and the power to forgive sins, something the scribes did not fully recognize. Only here in the Gospels is the forgiveness of sins attributed to the Son of Man. We see forgiveness is declared in verses 5. Forgiveness is questioned in verses 6 through 9. Forgiveness is validated in verse 11. And forgiveness is recognized in verse 12. He's forgiven and he's healed. Jesus commanded the paralytic to get up. It was a test of faith. So that guy is laying on his mat and Jesus says, get, get up. I mean, I don't, I, I don't know from a physiological standpoint or a medical standpoint, he probably had atrophy in his legs. He was probably, you know, if you haven't walked for a long time or you haven't stood for a long time or if you've never done it, that man had faith to say, if Jesus said it, I'm gonna do it. So the guy was obedient to Jesus' command. The man was unable to do this immediately in full view of them all, including Jesus' critics, the scribes. So Jesus used the earthly circumstances for a heavenly meaning. Jesus used this man's paralysis and not walking to show the scribes that he can heal, but he can also forgive sins. Jesus leveraged this. Daniel Adkins writes in his commentary on the book of Mark, as proof of his power to forgive sins, something that we cannot see, Jesus healed the paralytic, something everyone could see. I like that. As proof of his power to forgive sins, something that we cannot see, Jesus healed the paralytic, something that everyone could see. He is simple and direct in his statement. But so you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, pick up your mat or your bed and go home. The man responds with obedience of faith and does, does just that in front of everyone in the crowd. The response of the man and the crowd were appropriate, was appropriate. Even the Pharisees, even the teachers of the law had come from every village and town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. They saw what happened here. This man had been healed and his sins were forgiven. No one could deny it. All had seen what Jesus had done. It says that they were all amazed. It blew their minds. Just the scene blew their minds what Jesus can do. These four faithful friends, in spite of all of the odds, knew that Jesus could take care of their buddy. They went through all this difficulty getting him up on top of a roof. They dug a hole in the roof. They lowered him down in the roof. Jesus looks at him and says, son, your sins are forgiven. Then he says, take up your bed and walk. The title of the sermon today is Difficult Circumstances of Life with a Heavenly Outcome. How can God use our difficult circumstances of life for a heavenly outcome? Jesus has the authority to forgive sins. Jesus knows our hearts, and Jesus has compassion. Let us pray. 
Father in heaven, I, this was such a dramatic scene. I would love to have been on that little fishing village on the Sea of Galilee at that time, just watching this transpire, watching these four guys go to extreme lengths for their friend, watching Jesus as he used in earthly circumstances for a heavenly meaning, and then watching the crowd at the end amazed at what you had done. Father, thank you. Thank you, thank you that you save us through the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you that you know our hearts and know our hearts intimately. Father, I pray, if there's someone here that does not know you, speak to their minds and their hearts now and draw them to you by the power of your Holy Spirit. We know that you forgive sins. We know that you give us eternal life, but we also know that you love us as a father loves a child. First John chapter three, verse one, John writes that we are children of God. We're your kids. Father, thank you. Be with Mason, Holly, and the girls. God, I pray that as we break bread today in communion, that you're, that you're, that you're present with us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.